Good morning. Hopefully you can hear me and welcome to the uh, Early Intervention in Psychosis fifth annual forum. I've been told that we have over 100 people online currently and I'm not just sitting at home talking to my PC. Uh, so I am Alison Brabban and I'm a clinical advisor to the Adult Mental Health Programme at NHS England where I focus on the implementation of the Early Intervention Access Standard and on psychological therapies. So uh, welcome everyone and thanks for joining this morning. Um, we appreciate just how busy everyone has been over the last three months trying to keep services going in spite of all the restrictions related to the pandemic. So hopefully this morning you can have, a, and today in general, you can have a bit of a breather and today is about giving something back to you. Uh, so we really, today the plan is we are going to hopefully share uh, how things are nationally and give you a sense of what's happening across the country in relation to EI services. Uh, and really just to share kind of learning and innovations. Uh, really the EIPN has been established to uh, really ensure that services are offering high quality care and really meeting the diverse needs of our service users and carers across the country. So I've got to say three months ago, I wasn't sure if we would be having this forum this year because of COVID. So it's absolutely wonderful that we've been able to kind of present it online. I think that hopefully it means that a lot of you who wouldn't have been able to attend in person in London have been able to get here today. Um, so there are some advantages. Uh, I suppose the other advantage to me in terms of housekeeping is that I don't have to tell you where the nearest fire exits and your nearest loos are. Hopefully you know where they are. Um, uh, but we, for those of you who haven't actually been on a Microsoft Live event, I do have to go through a few things. So first and foremost, uh, you probably already worked out that you have all been placed on mute. So you aren't able to kind of speak to any of the presenters or ask any questions verbally. Uh, that doesn't mean to say that you can't make points or ask questions. But can I ask you to use um, uh, to put post any questions or comments using the Q&A function? The other thing is at the end, I mean, we've got a very, very tight schedule this morning, but I'm hoping that there will be some time to ask questions. So I will be uh, selecting one of the questions from the Q&I chat function. And so it would be helpful if, if there's a particular question that you're interested in, can you stick a thumbs up onto that question so that I can see which are the most popular questions and I will select those when asking our presenters. If we do run out of time and we don't have time for those questions and answers, uh, the presenters have all said to me that they will reply to your questions in the chat function. So please do, do post things in there. Also, um, just to say that this event is being run as two separate sessions. So this, you will have had to obviously log in this morning, but there's a separate login for this afternoon session. So uh, again, I think the link for that is embedded within this afternoon's agenda. So please do use that second login, not this morning's for this afternoon session. Um, and finally, uh, in terms of tweeting, uh, we have just established a hashtag for today's conference, which is hashtag EIPN20. Uh, feel free to, to tweet. The only thing I would say is that when it comes to Joe and Venu's presentation, uh, the, the national report hasn't been published yet. And so can I ask you to uh, refrain from uh, doing any kind of screenshots or tweeting the results of the national audit? So uh, that will have to wait until after the report's published in the middle of July, I think it's 13th of July. Anyway, I think that's my bit over. So I am gonna hand over to Steve Wakeling uh, and he is the Head of Quality and Accreditation at the Royal College of Psychiatrists. And he is going to give an update on the EIPN network. So over to you, Steve. <laughs> 
Thanks. Thank you very much, Alison, and a uh, pleasure to be here and speaking to all of you today. Thank you so much for uh, taking time um, out of what I'm sure are very busy schedules uh, to take part um, in the event. We really hope it will be worthwhile and you enjoy all of the content today. Um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what the Early Intervention in Psychosis um, Network is. Um, some of you may already be members, but for those who aren't, I think it'd be interesting just to hear a little bit about what we do. Um, so in the College of Psychiatrists, in what's called the CCQI, we work with mental health services to assess and improve the quality of care that they uh, provide. Um, and we work with more, more than 90% of mental health services uh, uh, providers in, in the UK. And we use a peer review model, um, and that means that a team of people with expert knowledge of the service visits uh, the host team um, to provide uh, a peer review. Um, the EIPN standards were co-produced uh, by a wide range of experts and people with lived experience, uh, and there are three types of uh, standards, uh, essential, expected and, and desirable standards. And they cover um, a range of areas, as you'd imagine, access, assessment, care planning, physical health care, uh, risk, service user engagement, soft development uh, and many other areas as well. And e, uh, EIPN, EPN, as we call it, it's a subscription uh, based service, so uh, teams uh, sign up to be a part of it. Um, just moving on, there's a couple of different membership options uh, that we have. Um, first is our developmental membership option, um, and the aim of that is to support services uh, to progress forward and improve uh, what the uh, standard of care they're providing. Um, it helps to identify areas for improvement um, and action planning to achieve these. And as a developmental member, you'd receive a review every year uh, to monitor how you're getting on as a team and, uh, and, and track that progress that you're making. We also offer an accreditation option membership um, and you sign up for a sort of a three year period um, and you have a visit at the beginning and end of that uh, process um, with an interview uh, review. Uh, in the middle and if you are successful um, when you have your first visit um, you will receive that uh, that badge of accreditation which lasts for three years. Okay so moving on I'll just tell you a little bit about the process um, of how um, a review works. Uh, the first stage for EPEN members is to complete a self-review. Teams are asked to self-assess themselves against our standards um, and state if they think that they meet them or not. Um, the EIPN team then provides surveys for staff and service users and carers and partner agencies and we try to use those to collect a range of different views. And the questions asked in those surveys relate to the standards and they help to provide additional information about whether the, uh, the service is meeting our standards. All surveys are collated by us as a team uh, and then we produce um, a report with all of the data uh, that we've collected so far. Moving on, the second part of the process um, is a peer review day. Um, we uh, arrange a peer review team um, and uh, schedule uh, a date. Um, that team, we usually involve uh, two or three professionals who've got expertise um, in the IP and services uh, and one or two um, service users or care representatives. The day is uh, structured with a timetable and it focuses on validating the information that we've collected uh, through the peer review. Um, and um, the team are there to uh, to help the host team share um, the good practice that they are achieving um, as well uh, to uh, focus on any challenges and think about how to overcome those. And then if um, you're part of the accreditation process, the final stage after you've had your, your peer review is to go forward uh, for accreditation, go to the accreditation committee. That committee is made up of other professionals who also have expertise in the field and again service user or care representatives. And the accreditation committee decides um, whether or not uh, the service meets the required standards to achieve accreditation based on all the information that's been gathered uh, up to that point. Um, and if we get to that stage and there's still a little bit more work to be done, um, there is the opportunity then uh, to um, provide a bit more evidence, do a little bit more work to get up uh, to, to reaching accreditation. 
So that's sort of how um, even works in terms of carrying out reviews and accrediting teams. Obviously, also we're involved in organizing events at this forum today. We've got a discussion group that uh, member services can be a part of. So um, overall, the network's a really good way to get in touch with other services, um, learn from how they're working and, and, and get some views about how you can develop your own service. Um, if you are interested in, in hearing a little bit more about what we do, you can get in touch um, with either myself or my colleague Taya, who's also part of the event today. You can visit our website um, and there you can download a free copy of the Ethan standards and have a look through those um, for yourself. Um, I'm also going to be um, monitoring the Q&A today with Alison. So if you do have any questions for me about how Ethan works or if you want to uh, ask uh, questions about the stands or anything like that, you can send questions through to me and I'll do my best to get back to you either today through the Q&A or I'll send you an email afterwards if we get in touch. OK, I think that's everything from, from me for now. Um, and I hope you have a fantastic day. I hope you really enjoy the event. Thanks very much, Steve. That was wonderful. And hopefully if anyone's got any questions, we've got nothing published yet in the Q&A. But as you say, uh, if, if people want to get in touch, then you will be here throughout the event today. So that's wonderful. Thank you very much. So I am now going to move this on and we are going to get an, an NHS England update from Tim Kendall, who's the National Clinical Director for Mental Health and from Jay Nen, who's the Senior Programme Manager at NHS England, who leads on all things EI uh, and is definitely a friend of the early intervention community. So I shall pass you over to Tim at this point, who is going to start this session. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Um, I'm, I'm hoping everyone can hear me. Thumbs up if you can. Good, good, good. That's great. Um, OK, I'm just going to give a relatively brief um, update on what's happening and what's happened nationally. So if you could move us to the next slide. So I'm going to cover long term plan commitments. I'm going to say something about um, successes so far, but then um, I'm going to say a little bit about what the impact of the coronavirus um, has had both in positive as well as in negative terms. Um, I think we all hear a lot about how, how bad it is, but it's also true that there have been some unexpected, well, perhaps unexpected benefits. So, OK, next slide. And the next one. OK, so um, as you as you all will be aware um, uh, that we've had quite a substantial investment. Um, it's uh, basically over a period of five years, a gradually increasing investment um, in mental health services to an additional 2.3 billion per year at least. It may be more than that, um, but by 2023 to 24 in that year, uh, the increase spend in mental health will be 2.3 billion pounds. Now, you know, to give you a flavour of what that's like, in Sheffield, which has got a population of 550,000 people, that's, that's effectively 23 million pounds more. Now, that's probably the biggest single increase in spending um, in mental health uh, that I that I recall in my entire career. So that's phenomenal. Um, now, most of that is going to go. The vast majority will be going on community services of different kinds. Um, and as you'll see in the in the two boxes, some of that is going into early intervention and you can see um, going into CCGs that there will be by year two. So that's uh, 2020 up to 21, so the period we're in now, that there's an additional 52 million going into um, into the baselines for CCGs just just for EI. So again, taking Sheffield as a one percent, so that's yeah an extra you know, 500,000 going into Sheffield. So that's that's pretty good. But if you have a look at the the, the section below, you'll see what's going into severe mental health problems, 
which includes um, psychosis. Um, and you'll see that by year five, it's an extra billion pounds going in. So that's a phenomenal increase in, in spend. Um, and as, as you'll see in the in the box below that, so at the bottom box, that will we'll be expecting that over that period of time that we'll maintain the access at 60% or more, and I know it's much, much more than that, um, but we'll expect that by 23, 24, that 95% um, that of people coming into EIP services uh, will have reached level three nice concordance. So that's, that's basically getting you know, the, the, the full Monty, as you might say. So next slide, please. Um, the success so far, we've maintained um, new monthly referrals, roughly around about 3,000 per month, great news percent access of care within two weeks. I mean, you know, we promised that by this stage it'd be up at 53%. We'd be moving 60% next year. Um, in fact, we're exceeding that and we're exceeding it above 70% throughout. Next slide. And more success if you look at people um, getting outcome measures, which is terribly important, much more important um, as, as time goes on, we do absolutely have to be able to demonstrate what benefits and we can only do that with outcome measures, but we're doing well. That's a nice, nice step up. People who started a course of CBTP, which is great news. Um, and, uh, and you can see we're up at an amazing 40, 46, 47% um, uh, by 18, 19, and no doubt we're still going up. Um, and people receiving employment and education support going up too. Um, now, um, if we can go to the next slide. Impact of COVID. Now, um, COVID's had a lot of, of, uh, uh, of impact on mental health services generally and on mental health. Now, impact on services is that the first thing we saw is that there was a fall off in people um, getting access to services, not new access so much as people um, not being able to connect with services quite so well. And we think part of that is fear of uh, of, of getting in touch with the health services generally, uh, but also that people, that, that staff, quite a lot of staff were off and so on. So, um, but things are perhaps changing as people get better at keeping connection with patients and, and so on. You will have heard a lot about the impact on uh, black and minority e ethnic staff, um, as well as patients um, that uh, data around the impact of COVID is that you get more, for some groups, there are more severe outcomes. And I know that uh, uh, from a lot of medical directors around the country, um, that those, uh, those people are being offered vitamin D supplements uh, from the start to ensure that they're, uh, that they're better protected from infection. But also that some groups, particularly South Asian groups, Bangladesh and so on, where there are very high rates of diabetes, that makes you particularly prone to a more severe illness. So um, that that's going on. Now, in terms of mental health, I think um, it's worth just summarising what are the sorts of things that we should be expecting and indeed is happening. Now, the impact of the pandemic itself is that it's created a great deal of health anxiety. And if you look at the social study done at UCL, um, high levels of anxiety and of depression, in fact, um, uh, which have not returned to pre-COVID levels. Um, some of the depression we think is probably linked to loss. I mean, there've been you know, 60,000 deaths, excess deaths during this time. Um, now, uh, others are that the impact of, of, of the pandemic on people with existing mental health problems, um, levels of anxiety have gone up and people have complained with uh, worsening OCD, worsening um, eating disorders uh, and so on. 
Uh, there's some speculation that the virus itself is neurotropic. And, and all I mean by that is that it gets into your nervous system. And you know that if, if, if you've had it, because there's an impact on sense of smell, impact on taste and so on. But there's also some suggestion that some people on ICU uh, are, have developed a, a new psychosis. That remains unconfirmed as far as I'm aware. Um, there is an impact from treatment. So um, a lot of people developing PTSD coming off ICU. Now we knew that before, that intensive care experience um, is likely to produce about 25%. There's a suggestion that that rate is up at 30. As the impact of lockdown itself, so uh, domestic violence, um, child abuse, um, people, children not going to school, the, um, the stresses of homeschooling, particularly if parents don't feel up to it, and some suggestion that young people, children and young people with autism and ADHD are finding that particularly tough. Um, I'm very aware that people with existing mental health problems have found um, uh, lockdown a really stressful experience. Um, I know that um, that you know that we we are seeing a lot of people coming forward saying that this has made their mental health problems worse, and that's borne out by the national surveys that we've got going at UCL and in Sheffield. And then finally, we've got something um, that we need to bear in mind going forward, which is that it's likely that debt will go up, unemployment will go up, um, homelessness is likely to rise, misuse rates we know are on the rise. Um, a catastrophic recession is likely to hit us, certainly over the next year to two years, but you know this may be for longer. Now, next slide. Next slide. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, so um, what, what, what are the benefits? Um, some real benefits have happened. People are using digital innovations rather better. And you'll see from the slide that across the health service that attend anywhere, which is um, it's a means of doing outpatient, effectively outpatient clinics um, w without having to leave your home. Um, and that that's you know increasing by the day and the number of hours that people are uh, spent in digital consultations and the time spent each day has gone up now as you'll know from this event it's not just connection between service uh, uh, between uh, healthcare professionals and service users but it's also uh, that we can do events like this which I don't recall um, this kind of event happening before. I'm sure it was possible, um, but we've had events, for example, the uh, some of the IAPT events, improving access to psychological therapies, where we've had events with 1,800 people attending uh, via uh, Microsoft Teams like this. Um, we've also seen um, other things happening, for example, the Ministry for Housing, Communities and Local Government have put millions of pounds into helping people uh, come off the street. Um, and a lot of those, uh, the people who are rough sleepers, are people with significant mental health problems. Um, and that's an area that I work in clinically. And I, I, I can absolutely guarantee you, I spend a lot of time going into hotels now. And, and that sounds dodgy, but that's not quite what I'm saying. Um, so seeing a lot of people um, coming off the street has been a, it's been fantastic. Um, and I guess there are other things that like decreased pollution, which is great um, associated with an Im with improved mental health, people doing much more exercise and so on. So there are some upsides to this. Um, and I, I'm sure you'll have noticed hardly anyone's wearing ties anymore. So that's got to be a good thing. OK. Now I'm going to hand over to Jay, um, who's going to um, continue uh, updating you on the national stuff. So, Jay. Thanks. 
Thanks so much, Tim. I'm just going to get a thumbs up from someone in the team. Yep, they can hear me. Great. Uh, Ted, if you want to go into the next slide for me. Um, so my name's Jay. Um, if I haven't met you yet, uh, hopefully I've met you at a clinical network event over the years. Um, thank you for the warm introduction, Ali, and thanks to Tim for setting that scene. Um, and it's so good to be here today. I think uh, as Steve was just saying that we've got over 400 people joining, which um, we've never been able to get into the room at RC site previously and people have always missed out. So it's uh, fantastic that today we've been able to get everyone um, into um, here around the latest NCAP um, scores and results, uh, but also get to share in the really good practice um, that's on the agenda for today. So if I can just go on to the next slide. Thanks. Um, so as Tim uh, has already kind of highlighted, uh, we've got some significant investment going into community mental health and EIP is definitely a big part of that. Um, a really strong message in the long term plan and the implementation plan that EIPs remains a priority. Uh, the access and waiting time standards not going away. Um, and I think uh, the standard was introduced in 2016. And we're really keen to see uh, teams continue to improve and deliver better care. So in the implementation plan, we outlined a key number of uh, improvements we want to see over the years. Uh, that includes uh, provision for all ages, so um, a real focus on under 18s, um, but also uh, continuing uh, that all teams provide care for over 35s as well. And I think the NCAP results will show that we've seen a, uh, an increase in that coverage of both age groups, uh, but we've still got a little bit to go with a few teams uh, not there yet. Um, so a bit of work to do with commissioners um, and teams jointly uh, to make sure that we've got all age coverage across the country. Uh, we're really keen that we continue uh, to support uh, teams to deliver services for people with an at-risk mental state. I think as Tim was kind of outlining before around the impact of COVID, it's more important than ever. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a bit. Um, and I think with those two bits around all age uh, services and at risk mental state, um, the long term plan implementation is that areas should start uh, working to deliver those services now, uh, working with commissioners, um, and working with teams and your and your mental health trust uh, to start delivering those now rather than waiting for 23, 24. Uh, as Tim's already outlined, we're really keen that we continue to support all teams to uh, improve the quality of care that you're delivering. So asking that all teams uh, are at level three NAS concordance, so effectively rated good um, by 23-24. And we've seen really uh, huge improvements in that across the years, and I'm sure we'll continue to see improvements um, ongoing as well. Uh, the referral to treatment element of the standard continues to be met. It's a huge success story. Um, you would have seen in those slides but that we've managed to maintain a huge number of new referrals um, and that means heaps of assessment activity for teams, uh, but we've managed to continue to meet that referral to treatment out of the standard. It's a huge success um, and Tim's already outlined around the significant new investment uh, for baselines as well. So we'll just go to the next slide. Um, so I think going forward uh, for 2020-21 this year, a real focus for us will be using the NCAP data to, to really understand um, uh, who's providing all age services and what are the differences in care and some of the outcomes uh, that children are receiving and that people aged over 35 uh, receive when they come into early intervention services. So uh, we'll hopefully see better coverage um, of all age services, but the, as I said, there's still some teams that, um, uh, that have work to do with their commissioners uh, working in partnership with their trust uh, to really make sure that they're delivering a full age range and full service. Um, in terms of at-risk mental state, um, it's more important than ever to support people at risk of developing psychosis, as Tim's already outlined. And I just pulled, um, I thought, some really good stats from a recent Rethink survey around the impact of the pandemic and COVID, with over three quarters of people saying that their mental health had got much worse um, as a result of the pandemic and the measures to contain it. And also 42% said their mental health was worse because they were getting less support from their mental health services. So I think that gives us a really good indication of what the wider population um, is currently going through and some of the support we need to put in place. Um, 
So we're going to continue um, to push at risk mental state and providing care to those people at risk of psychosis as a priority nationally. Um, I'm really keen uh, to use the NCAP data um, that Joe will present later today to understand uh, which areas we need to support on um, for that in a more targeted way. Go to the next slide, thanks, Ted. Thanks. Um, so as part of that support, we were really keen that we update the commissioning guidance uh, that came out when the standard was first introduced. A um, couple of reasons for that. Uh, we wanted to include the new long term plan ambitions um, and especially around some of the new policy coming through around community mental health transformation more widely. So we wanted to update the commissioning guidance with that. We also wanted to provide a bit more guidance and support around uh, what uh, we're expecting around at risk mental state and also uh, including updates on children and young people as well, knowing that uh, it's a really important age group um, and cohort that we need to um, provide better care for in EIP teams. So uh, we started this work pre COVID. Um, and we established a task and finish group and we had uh, done a lot of reviewing and updating guidance um, based on available evidence and expert opinion um, and then COVID hit so we've slightly put it on hold uh, for a while but looking to um, start that work again uh, over the next couple of months so that we could have something out in the summer. Um, so we're looking to undertake some engagement post-COVID, or well, post-COVID, I suppose we continue to live with COVID, but um, when things have slightly settled down, hopefully into the summer, um, doing some engagement through clinical network events. Um, so please look out for that, really keen to make sure we get it right and that it's useful uh, for teams and commissioners as well. I think it's my last slide. Cheers. Um, so understanding and improving data quality. So last year at this event, I had to stand up and say that we still hadn't managed to retire the MHSDS, uh, which everyone will know I usually say that at every event that I go to. I'm happy to say this year that I can say that we've actually retired uh, the Unify SDCS uh, collection rather. And so now uh, we are only monitoring the two week weight element of the standard uh, via the MHSDS. Um, and so a huge amount of work went into that. Uh, via teams to get the data quality um, right for MHSDS. And so now we're able to use and just have one data source and use the MHSDS. Um, we're continuing to use the EIP triangulation tool and it's got even more data now. Hopefully people have seen Carl uh, Money present on this. He's the guy that developed it. Um, it's even got more data around finance and SNOMED. Um, and I've just put a quick screenshot up there of the type of spend um, and finance information uh, that's there. And um, uh, so please do use it. Um, please have a look. You can see what type of investment your CCG is reporting um, into early intervention psychosis and also um, compare and contrast against your neighbours as well. Um, some of the focus going forward, uh, SNOMED, SNOMED, SNOMED. Um, so really, really keen um, that areas uh, focus on improving their um, reporting and recording of SNOMED uh, codes and interventions um, and that you're able to report that to the MHSDS. Really keen that we're able to uh, use that data um, to understand variation, uh, but also hopefully be able to um, use that instead of case note audits in the NCAP uh, into future years as well. Really keen, as Tim's talked about, uh, BAME populations and other inequalities that we're seeing in um, people with first episode psychosis. Um, I'll hold my hand up and I don't think we've done enough nationally as a national program to support teams uh, to focus on that. Um, so really keen that we do that going forward. And um, today's an opportunity in the Q&A. Please put your thoughts and questions um, into the chat function. I'm happy to respond to those throughout the day as well. Um, and really, really keen that we understand how we can use the outcomes data in a really meaningful way um, and share some really good practice around how people are using that outcomes data going forward. And I think that might be my last slide, Ty. If you can go into the next one. Yep. Um, so thank you very much for having me today. Um, I'll be around for most of the day. Um, so please put any questions into the chat function, Q&A chat function. Um, and if you just put, uh, if you put my name, Jay, um, I'll know which ones uh, that you're directing at me. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to answer any of those questions throughout the day. Thanks.
Okay, I think you can hear me now. So thank you very much, Tim and Jay. That was great, really good update. Um, I have got a couple of questions and I'm going to direct this one at Jay. And just in terms of what Jay was saying, I, I should have said when you are putting things in the Q&A, it would be really helpful going forward if you can say who your question is directed towards, because it's going to get more and more confusing as we go through the day. So Jay, just in terms of questions that are being asked, I think the, the kind of hot topic for today is about funding and ensuring that funding uh, that is supposedly ring fenced is getting through from CCGs to EIP. We're hearing a lot of services and trusts are, oh, sorry, trusts are saying that the money's not there. Uh, and I suppose it's the question is, how can we ensure that that money does get through to EIP services and does it does the money always have to go through CCG baselines? Mm -hmm. Yep, really good question. Um, uh, and it's something that we've been kind of grappling with since uh, EIP standard was introduced. And I think uh, we all would agree that it would probably make our lives easy, uh, much easier if it was targeted transformation funding. Um, I think it's a reflection that uh, early intervention psychosis is, is probably being seen as business as usual. Um, that it's a core offer that services and CCGs have to commission, and that's why it sits in CCG baselines. Um, however, I, I'm very aware that doesn't uh, make it easy for um, some of those really tricky conversations between commissioners and uh, services uh, to make sure that funding is going through. Um, so uh, if I'm being blunt, I don't think uh, we're going to see um, EIP funding go back to transformation funding. I think it will continue to sit in CCG baseline funding. However, um, doing much more work around being much more transparent around what that spend looks like. Um, so as I uh, just highlighted before, we uh, all CCGs have to report what they're spending on early intervention psychosis services and we include that in the EIP triangulation tool so everyone's able to see that. And through the mental health investment standard, we also track um, how much spend is going into mental health. Um, and a line of that is around early intervention psychosis. So CCGs have to report to us what they're spending um, and we make that data uh, available to everyone. So um, hopefully that helps in terms of transparency. Um, I think the other thing that's really helped us um, and will continue to help us is the long term plan implementation tool, um, which has really been able to define um, exactly what we're after uh, and what we're asking CCG commissioners to deliver. Um, and I think hopefully with the new updated guidance that will hopefully get out a bit later in the year, um, that that will give even more impetus to commissioners to actually commission what we're asking them to do and get that money to frontline services as well. You're on mute, Ali. Ali, sorry, you're on mute. Oh gosh, sorry, uh, <laughs> it's me talking away. We've only got a couple of minutes left, Jay. Uh, so I'm going to ask you a very quick question, but another one to do with, with funding. And I suppose it's something that's on everyone's mind and is how much assurance can we be get that that funding for EIP won't be pulled in light of the economic impact of COVID? So I think you've got about 30 seconds, Jay. OK, uh, thanks for that, Ali. Love. Uh... Lovely challenge there, 30 seconds. Um, so I think uh, the money is still there. Um, it's not going anywhere. I think we're just trying to work out now how that all flows in light of the slightly late period of where we are in the year. Um, so as far as I'm aware and concerned, uh, all that uh, long term plan transformation uh, funding and CCG baseline funding uh, will still flow and will still go uh, to CCGs and STPs for them to spend. But happy to pick that up in comments and questions in the Q&A function as well. Thanks very much, Jay. That's great. Uh, and as I say, uh, Jay is going to be around for most of the morning and some of this afternoon. So if you do have any questions, please do put them in the Q&A uh, section of, of the live events. So thanks again, Jay. That's great. So uh, hopefully you can hear me and see me um, and at this point of the day I am absolutely delighted that we are welcoming Nev Jones who is assistant professor uh, at the Department of Psychology and Behavioral Neurosciences at the University of South Florida. Um, 
Nev was herself supported by an early intervention service in, in the States, but since then has given so much back in terms of her research and writing. And I think it's fair to say that thousands of early intervention services around the world and millions probably of service users have benefited from her wisdom. Uh, I can see Nev on my screen and it looks like she's in the uh, uh, atrium at the Royal College of Psychiatrists, but I know she's actually <laughs> in Florida as we speak. So she's got a very early to, to be here, but it's absolutely wonderful to have you online, Nev. So I'm going to pass you over and you're going to be with us for the next, oh, you've got 20 minutes now. Thank you very much. Okay, can, uh, thanks, Alison. Can everyone hear me? You guys, yes. Awesome. Can you see my, the PowerPoint now? Yes, yeah. okay. <laughs> Um, I'll, it's, it's very early in the morning for me, but it's, um, it's, it's, it's quite a treat to wake up and get to see uh, Allison, who's one of my favorite people on the planet. Um, and I guess the, the, the 400 or however many people um, actually managed to make it this morning out there. Um, so I, I took this as sort of an opportunity to, um, to be a bit more reflective. Um, and not get too preoccupied with sort of the details and minutia of research. So I, I um, sort of am playing a little bit loose in terms of methods. Um, and the, the uh, opted to focus on is sort of this question of what happens after early intervention um, and, and is sort of thinking about and taking stock of different strategies, different potential approaches to sort of try and shore up longer term, longer term outcomes and longer term recovery trajectories. OK, so I, I suspect that it is in, in, in no way news to the vast majority, if not um, all of you in the audience, that there are a lot of concerns and questions about the extent to which the benefits of early intervention are sustained over the long term. Um, it's not a crystal clear picture that kind of emerges from the research that we have across different trials and different national settings. We see different patterns of sort of post-discharge uh, effects. So deterioration in some areas, flatlining in some areas, improvement in some, but maybe not um, improvement that still remains uh, significant in comparison to a control group. Um, and of course, different national settings in terms of just what, um, you know, kind of basic mainstream mental health services look like and, you know, hence what it means to be discharged from specialized DI. Um, is going to have an impact. And, and although we do have some amount of data, and certainly I would say enough data to suggest that there are problems, uh, it's somewhat surprising to me that, that this topic has not gotten more attention. And particularly when we look at the, the kind of the qualitative literature or attempts in a more detailed, nuanced, contextualized way to look at what is happening to um, to people after they're discharged from EI services, it's really kind of an astonishingly small literature. Like less than you know, less than five qualitative articles have looked at this. Um, so where do we go from here? Um, so kind of thinking about different commentaries, different research efforts that that either directly or indirectly have tied into or been framed in terms of uh, kind of post discharge services. Those at the top here in blue, I think, have been the most explicitly framed in terms of kind of sustaining the gains or benefits of early intervention or improving long term outcomes. So reducing duration of untreated psychosis is one, and the TIPS trial is often cited as an example of a um, really an early de detection as opposed to true early intervention strategy. 
that seems to have yielded significantly improved long-term outcomes. So that's one possibility. Um, the DUP literature is also equivocal. Um, recently, as some of you are probably aware, John Kane's group um, published a paper um, kind of making the case that uh, that 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 part of the at least sort of short term ostensibly benefit impacts of shorter DUP um, is actually a kind of artifact of not looking at time since onset of illness or adequately controlling for that. So DUP one possibility extending early intervention services. So typically from a two or five year um, length of service to five years. So Opus 2, the Montreal PEP extension trial um, are examples. And again, the results have been uh, somewhat equivocal and, um, you know, kind of many different ways that we can interpret those findings. Again, in some cases seeming to, seeming to suggest that there are benefits and others not and not necessarily in my reading suggesting that this is the answer that extending EIP alone sort of resolves this 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 the, the underlying issues um, stronger transition and step down practices I think is starting to get more attention now um, so there's of course the possibility that the transition itself could be for for some people traumatic even difficult lead to discontinuities that are actually damaging long term prospects, even for those who did did very well or were doing very well up to the point of transition. We don't have a lot of direct evidence um, strengthening post discharge mental health services across the board. So actually a number of kind of leading international figures in, in EI have made the case that, you know, um, that sort of the big upshot here is that we just really need to work on on improving mental health services and actually learning from early intervention models. Then in the green we have, um, I think, some some areas of research that we could make a case connect in that typically are not as explicitly framed as um, answers or strategies with respect to to to, to discharge in the post discharge period. So medication discontinuation and just in general, uh, reduced initiation and reduced overall use of antipsychotics. So we see that in um, Vindering's work um, and in, in, in a lot of the sort of literature around open dialogue. Um, some of that obviously being implemented in the UK through Odessi. And then one could make a case that there's still a ways to go in terms of refining or augmenting core intervention components. Um, so an example might be cognitive remediation. You might hear people say, well, you know, we do many things well in EI, but we don't yet have kind of widespread implementation of cognitive remediation that is, you know, kind of essential to vocational and career outcomes. Um, recently, obviously, uh, you know, kind of ramped up attention to e-health and m-health, but these are possibilities. Therapy itself, use of clozapine and LAIs, so kind of the we can strengthen EI and by strengthening EI um, that might improve longer term outcomes. Um, so a somewhat different perspective, and it's not that I want to be in any way dismissive of any of those possibilities. At the end of the day, I think where the field is at now, we don't have the we don't have the data and we haven't done the work in the sense of deep consultation, really hearing from people, really looking at um, trajectories um, after after clients leave uh, early intervention in, an, in a more nuanced way. But so these are in a way more more kind of hunches and emergent themes from the work that I've been doing around this issue. So so one of them is to sort of, um, you know, kind of hone in more on autonomous motivation, which I'll say more about um, identifying and supporting poor outcome subgroups, because, of course, in this sort of trials follow up literature, we're looking at averages. We're not in general looking at 
potentially very different latent trajectories across different groups. Um, and then kind of career de development and career mobility and how we set young people up for that as opposed to simply getting them into employment or education. Um, and so here's my, you know, kind of very free and loose uh, research methods here. Um, in the kind of current research I'm doing, um, I've completed about 40 trajectory interviews with former service users that's sort of tracing out everything that's happened to them since they were discharged across kind of all the major life domains. Um, 80 current service users not yet discharged, 10 family members, um, and 35 early intervention clinicians. Plus sort of a history of analysis and, and of quantitative and administrative data, both directly and indirectly related to these topics. So autonomous motivation. Um, for anyone who's already familiar with the self-determination theory literature, autonomous motivation is kind of a core construct and it's where we really want to get in terms of thinking about behavior change. So the idea and this 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 particular table or, or figure is probably a little bit excessively complex, but the general idea is as long as the motivation is sort of externally regulated um, to some extent, we are engaging in behaviors, whether that's trying to quit smoking, exercising, um, or engaging in services for the, for the wrong reasons. And that once that external motivation is kind of removed, we're not necessarily going to continue or persist with the, with the behavior, whatever that might be. So we move towards sort of the green side um, of this table, which is autonomous motivation. We're, we're increasingly doing things for ourselves, deeply for ourselves, for our own reasons. The motivation is internal. Um, and so, you know, what, what I have observed in a lot of my interviews um, is that many young people so in the in the us we have not we have not yet kind of reached the point of expanding early intervention access to to, to older age groups so we're really talking about young people um very often even when they have had very very good experiences of ei report sort of seeing uh their 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 discharge as an opportunity to finally discontinue medications or antipsychotics typically um and so what what is kind of intriguing to me about about this is that um th this is certainly true in some cases among young people who have ex perceived or experienced a lot of explicit or implicit coercion and pressure. Um, so sort of a failure of shared decision making in a rather overt sense. And in addition to that, I think questioning the benefits um, and or having lots of concerns about side effects. Um, and all of that is going to be modulated by kind of individual effectiveness, underlying symptoms and course, because some people do absolutely fine off of antipsychotics and we know that. Um, but but I'm sort of more concerned with the group who, because of this perceived coercion, you know, really sees discharge as an opportunity to completely sort of move away from services and treatment in general and end up, and I've heard many such stories, going off medications and, and experiencing, you know, sort of very... Um, very challenging things in their life as a result, like losing a job, losing employment, um, you know, kind of failing out of school or failing courses. Um, there's this other group who actually, you know, reports a very, very kind of, you know, kind of positive experience of EI. No coercion or pressure in kind of the conventional sense but instead that they have ended up consistently taking medications to please clinicians that they describe themselves as having a very positive relationship with. So this in terms of self-determination theory is still a form of external motivation, introjection, in, introjection in, the, in, the, in the technical language of SDT. Um, so 
while they're questioning the benefits, as long as they're working with this team or this individual in terms of their, you know, kind of therapist or key worker who they deeply value, care about, care about what that individual thinks about them, they take medications. As soon as they leave the program, again, in a parallel way, it becomes the opportunity to, to discontinue medications. Now, if they do fine without medications, that's great. Um, and if they don't, again, we see these kinds of stories where, you know, kind of relapses result outside the sort of protective bubble of the EI team and the sort of conventional system response to a relapse can be, you know, very damaging as well as, you know, how that plays out in terms of their life. So, you know, so, so, so my sort of, you know, kind of concluding, con concluding thoughts on this topic of, of kind of autonomy is that while we talk almost universally about shared decision making in EI and increasingly in mental health services in general, I'm not, I'm not convinced. I think shared decision making is a great aspirational goal, a very important aspirational goal, and I think it's incredibly hard to actually implement and enact, if not impossible. You know, so I think in some way we could even speculate that this idea of truly shared decision making just kind of does not adequately attend to the complexities and microdynamics of power and how they play out across clinical relationships in ways we can't necessarily um, address. Um, and I think it underestimates the existential implications of both a schizophrenia diagnosis or, you know, kind of psychosis in the U.S. We tend to be much more preoccupied with um, limiting EI services to schizophrenia spectrum, but whether we're talking about schizophrenia or whatever psychotic disorder and an associated kind of implication of a dependence on antipsychotics, I think that is very, very challenging um, for, for young people or anyone experiencing this for the first time to work through. And I'm not convinced that shared decision-making processes and protocols as they're currently operationalized really support that deeper process of kind of working through um, these, 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 these implications, which are very, very deep. And then finally, this idea that a strong therapeutic alliance, for better or for worse, is simply not the same thing as, as, as a, a relationship that supports autonomy um, in spite of the absolute best, you know, in, in intentions of, of the therapist. Okay, so second, um, brief comments, and I am, because I am seeing the, the PowerPoint instead of the the screen. I hope that I'm still doing okay in terms of time. Um, but very quickly, um, kind of the poor outcome subgroups. I think what we see is groups within EI who are not benefiting um, to the extent that other groups are, um, to, to put it in a very simplified way. Um, and when I think about, you know, kind of what this means or how I personally operationalize it, um, it means, for example, being discharged to higher levels of care, assertive community treatment, being placed on a community treatment order, incarceration or forensic care, unable to work or attend school, and ongoing distress, kind of subjectively. Um, and I think the two kind of groups that, that, that I've really I identified in my work are those whose symptoms, experiences, distress, disability are really not responding to available treatments and supports, whether that's, you know, different therapeutic approaches, the whole battery of kind of medications, clozapine, LAIs, and there's just really persistent disability there that we haven't kind of really figured out how to, how to impact. And then structural and socioeconomic adversity, um, and I'm very much including kind of structural racism and all of its consequences um, and the very complex ways in which the, the, these kind of, you know, um, contexts impact on, you know, ability to participate fully, to, to benefit, 
to reintegrate in, 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 in society in the sense of, you know, finding work and integrating in school, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think because I'm running short on time, um, my kind of final, final point of this sort of triad would be career development and mobility. And it was interesting to see the statistics just a bit ago uh, in terms of implementation of supported education and employment services in the UK. I was sort of aware of this. Um, much more common um, in the US, in fact, it's, it's really very much considered a core component of EI and you're not kind of um, delivering or implementing EI to fidelity without it. Um, but the way that we typically sort of measure outcomes in this space is in terms of quantity, meaning having a job, having competitive employment, part time or full time, um, rather than quality. And I think in particular, when we're looking at young people, what really, really matters is not whether they have a job, which could be a very, you know, very menial, low wage job with no prospects of ever turning into something that that kind of carries a living wage. We really need to look at has somebody kind of really set out on a career path with the potential for a living wage and other things that matter to the individual in terms of what it means to 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 sort of experience flourishing in a vocational sense. And I think we have a long, long way to go here. And um, part of the interviews I've been doing really kind of probes young people on their career trajectories and how EI has impacted that um, in always in cases in which there's ostensibly high fidelity supported education and employment offered. And I do not see that translating into, you know, um, kind of crystallization of a, of a coherent career path. Um, in fact, it's extremely rare to see that and, and in, in any way that's directly tied to, to EI. And clearly, if we think about longer term outcomes, this is absolutely key because at least in the US, if you are living off of public benefits, that's essentially living condemned to an extremely high level of poverty. Um, OK, so that's that's it. I will end there. I hope that that was just sort of a bit bit provocative, um, raises some issues and questions. Again, we have a long way to go in terms of research that really kind of in a deeper and more systematic way elucidates these issues. Thank you so much, Nev. You got through so much there in so little time. You've given us so much food for thought. I think we could probably spend about the next hour um, discussing some of the content uh, of your presentation. But I'd like just to, and th there's a few questions, but I'm actually uh, going to use Chair's prerogative here and I'm going for the final question that's come through. And Nev, it's a question that says, people still don't get told about the adverse effects of starting neuroleptics in the context that psychiatrists feel significant pressure to prescribe. Do you have any ideas about what to do about this situation? How can we be more honest with people so they can make informed shared decisions about whether to take neuroleptics in the context of other approaches available in AI? It's quite a long question, but I think <laughs> just uh, you've probably got a minute or two just to try and <laughs> I'll, well, I'll try to be very do. quick. I mean, originally I was going to actually put a slide where I had sort of the psychiatrist solution, you know, which we all know about, and then have the activist solution on the other side, because I think one of the biggest problems is the degree of polarization around medications. And it is, you know, every bit as much a phenomenon kind of on both of these poles. So, if you go to Madden America or, or you kind of Google antipsychotics, there is so much, um, and I hope it's not too controversial to say this, but I think there's a lot of fear mongering. There's a lot of incredibly inaccurate information that sort of paints all antipsychotics as, you know, kind of ex both extraordinarily ineffective and extremely damaging to kind of long term health and well being. And then on the other side, and I think, you know, again, this is how kind of political polarization functions is that each sort of side gets increasingly pushed into an ideologically rigid position. You see sort of this defensiveness about antipsychotics. 
And, you know, kind of what's in between is the fact in my mind that that psychosis, psychotic disorders, whatever language we want to use, are incredibly heterogeneous. And it is absolutely the case that there are people who don't need medications of any kind. In fact, there's people who probably in the absence of any treatment would do fine because they have one episode of psychosis and let's say it resolves and they never experience anything again. You have other people who, as I've indicated, with all the medications in the world and all the access to therapies um, are, are still not improving. What they're up against is just extremely difficult and extremely uh, persistent. And then you have all these groups in between. So I think the challenge right now is that if you try to kind of Google and find information about medications, you really there's you, you see a lot of a lot of ideology and you see a lot of, you know, kind of really hyped up arguments on both sides. And that makes shared decision making, you know, or whatever we aspirationally mean by that exceptionally difficult. Um, I have not yet seen a resource that really does justice to the sort of nuances and complexities of what we know and really, really underscores what we don't know because on both sides, we in essence, um, you know, I think in order to kind of answer the key questions that people have, we actually don't have, we don't have the research, we don't have the data, we don't have answers for people. And what that means is that, you know, in some way you're having to make decisions with very little to go on. And nobody likes that. Providers don't like that. Advocates don't like that. Certainly, you know, that is very dysphoric to, to family members and individuals themselves. And yet we have to make those decisions anyway, even under those circumstances. So that's my, I, I, I will stop there because we could certainly talk for many hours, um, but, but but that's my kind of brief, brief thoughts. Thank you, Nev, that was wonderful. I, I'm hoping, I know you're gonna kind of go because we've got to move on with this morning's agenda, but I hope you've got an opportunity to read through some of the comments in the Q&A because there's a, you've had a lot of people are really appreciating what you've had to say.